Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. As some of you may know, I've uh, recently published a book about the historical Jesus. This uh, admittedly is no easy task. Outside of the New Testament, there's almost no trace of the simple Galilean peasant who lived 2,000 years ago in a land that the Romans called Palestine. In fact, there are only a handful of things about which we can be fairly certain when speaking of the Jesus of history. One of those things is that he was a Jew, which may seem obvious, but it's not such a bad idea to remind ourselves of that every once in a while. Another is that he launched a Jewish movement, the purpose of which was to establish the kingdom of God, and the consequences of which was his arrest, torture, and execution by Rome as a state criminal. The third thing that we are fairly confident about when it comes to Jesus of Nazareth is that he was an exorcist and a miracle worker. Now, that may be a weird thing for a scholar and a historian to admit, but the fact is that we have more accumulated historical material confirming Jesus' status as a miracle worker than we do regarding either his birth in Bethlehem or his death in Golgotha. Now, let me be clear here for a moment. I'm not saying that we have historical evidence to support any particular miraculous action by Jesus. What I'm saying is that the perception of Jesus as an exorcist and a miracle worker was something that everyone his friends and enemies, his followers and his detractors, those who believed he was the Messiah and those who thought he was a charlatan, all seemed to agree upon. Now, to be fair, Jesus was not the only miracle worker trolling through Palestine, healing the sick and casting out demons. This was a world steeped in magic. And Jesus was just one of an untold number of diviners and dream interpreters, magicians and medicine men who wandered Galilee and Judea. However, there are two very obvious and distinct things that separated Jesus from all these other exorcists and miracle workers of his time. The first is that Jesus did not charge a fee for his services. And it seems like a crazy thing to, to bring up, but it's really no small matter. You see, in first century Palestine, the professional wonder worker was a vocation as well established as that of woodworker or mason, and far, far better paid. <laughs> the Galilee especially abounded with charismatic fantasts claiming to channel the divine for a fee. Even the temple priests charged a fee for their healings and their purification rituals. But according to the New Testament, what set Jesus apart from the rest of these guys was his refusal to accept any kind of payment for his healings. As he commands his disciples in the Gospel of Mark, quote, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. You received these gifts without payment. Give them out without payment. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Again, this was an extremely unusual act in Jesus' time. And it probably goes some way to explaining the great crowds of impoverished, sick, and infirm who would gather to him whenever he entered a village or a town. Of course, Jesus' free healings were not the only thing that set him apart from his fellow miracle workers. There was something else, something that can be glimpsed in the passage that we just read about the healing of the leper in the Gospel of Matthew. Go show yourself to the priest, Jesus tells the leper he had just healed of his affliction, and offer to him the gift that the law of Moses commanded. What you have to understand about this passage is that Jesus is joking. He's making a joke. This is his sense of humor coming out. 
His command to the leper is a jest. You see, the leper is not just ill, he's impure. He is ceremonially unclean. His leprosy prohibits him from entering the temple. It forbids him from from coming before the presence of God. The sick, the lame, the leper, the demon-possessed, menstruating women, those with bodily discharges, those who had recently given birth. In Jesus' time, none of these people were permitted to enter the temple and to take part in the Jewish cult unless they were first purified by a priest according to the priestly code. Now that code is what Jesus is referring to when he tells the leper to offer the priest the gifts commanded by the law of Moses. According to the law of Moses, the only way for a leper like him to be cleansed is to go through the most laborious and costly ritual, one that could be conducted solely by a priest. This is what the code says in Leviticus 14, the code that Jesus is referring to. First, the leper must bring the priest two clean birds, along with some cedar wood, some crimson yard, and some hyssop. One of the birds must be sacrificed immediately, and the living bird, the cedar wood, the yarn, and the hyssop, dipped in its blood. The blood must then be sprinkled upon the leper and the living bird released. Seven days later, the leper has to return, shave off all of his hair, and bathe himself in water. On the eighth day, the leper must take two male lambs, free of any kind of blemish, and one ewe lamb, also without blemish, as well as a grain offering of choice flour mixed with oil, back to the priest, who will then make of them a burnt offering to the Lord. The priest must smear the blood from the offering on the leper's right earlobe, on his right thumb, and on the big toe of his right foot. He must then sprinkle the leper with the oil seven times. Only after all of this has been completed shall the leper be considered free of the sin and guilt that led to his leprosy in the first place. Only then shall he be allowed to enter the presence of God. Only then can he rejoin the community of the faithful. Now, obviously, Jesus is not telling the leper he is just healed to buy two birds, two lambs, a ewe, a strip of cedar wood, a spool of crimson yard, a sprig of hyssop, a bushel of flour, and a jar of oil, and to give them all to the priest as an offering to God. He is telling the leper to present himself to the priest having already been cleansed. This is a direct challenge not just to the priest's authority, but to the temple itself. And therein lies a clue to what I believe is the meaning of Jesus' healings in the New Testament. For with every leper cleansed, every paralytic healed, every demon cast out, Jesus was not only challenging the priestly code, he was invalidating the very purpose of the priesthood itself. Because, and this is the most important thing, Jesus did not only heal the leper, he purified him. He made him eligible to appear at the temple as a true Israelite. And he did so for free as a gift from God, without tithe, without sacrifice. Thus seizing for himself the the powers that the priesthood granted to themselves solely to deem a man worthy of entering the presence of God. I wrote my historical study of Jesus because I believe that you can be a follower of Jesus without being a Christian, just as I believe that you can be a Christian without being a follower of Jesus. (laughs) What does it mean? What, What does being a follower of Jesus mean? It means fighting the powers that be, whether political or religious, on behalf of the sick and dispossessed, the poor and the marginalized, the outcast. It means rejecting those who use his name to empower themselves politically or to enrich themselves economically. It means always taking the side of the individual 
over the institution. And refusing to accept the proposition that has been embedded in our society and in Jesus' society that there are gatekeepers to salvation, that there are some among us who get to speak on behalf of God. There are not. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus means taking the side of the poor against the rich, the weak against the mighty, the meek against the strong. Only then may we be, as the psalmist says, men and women who conduct ourselves with integrity, who work for justice, who speak truth from the heart, who look with contempt on the corrupt and stand up against those who exploit the innocent. Only then can we be truly called followers of Jesus, and only then can nothing ever shake us. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.